Amen. Uh, give Jesus a hand clap. Amen. Uh, yeah. We wouldn't be anywhere without him. We wouldn't have anything without him. We wouldn't be anything without him. Jesus, he, he paid it all. He stretched his hands out and he took the nails for us so that we could know what true love is and we can experience the love of God. And uh, we can help others experience it too. If you would, take your Bibles and we're going to start in Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. We're going to read a very interesting story that took place in the life of Abraham and in the life of his nephew Lot. Genesis chapter 18. And when you get there, just say hallelujah. hallelujah. There you go. Amen. Just give me a smile and a nod. I think most of y'all are there. Genesis chapter 18, starting at verse 1. And this is what took place in the days and times of Abraham. Then the Lord appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre, as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and bowed himself to the ground, and said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Please let a little water be brought, and I wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring you a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. After that, you may pass by, and as much as you have come to your servant. And they said, Do as you have said. So Abraham hurriedly went to the tent to Sarah and said, Quickly, make ready three measures of meal, knead it, and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a tender and good calf, gave it to a young man, and he hastened to prepare it. So he took butter and milk and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree as they ate. And they said to him, Where is, your, where is Sarah, your wife? So he said, here in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to a year. And behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Sarah listening in the tent door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return in a year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, No, but you did laugh. Then the men arose from there and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to send them on. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed by him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteous and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. And the Lord said, Because of the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, because their sin is very grave, I will go down and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know. And the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood before the Lord. And Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are fifty righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for fifty righteous who were in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, I will spare all the place for their sakes. Then Abraham said to him, Indeed now I am but dust and ash, but I have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose there are five less than fifty. Would you destroy all the city for the lack of five? And he said, I If I find forty-five, I will not destroy it. And he spoke to him yet again and said, Suppose there be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for the sake of the forty. Then he said, Let not the, ang the Lord be angry, 
and I will speak. Suppose 30 should be found there. And he said, I will not do it if 30 were found there. And he said, Indeed, now I have taken upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 shall be found there. And he said, I would not destroy it for the sake of the 20. Then he said, Let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak once more. Suppose 10 should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. So the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the life and testimony of Abraham, how you called him, he listened to you, and he believed in you, and you accounted it to him as righteousness. Father, I'm so thankful that we all can have that same righteousness in our lives and that love because of the faith we have in Jesus. Lord, this morning I pray that you would move me aside, let the very spirit of Jesus minister to every heart and mind, God, that we may see you move in our community in a big and powerful way. And we pray this in the name of Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. I uh, love, there's so many beautiful, powerful stories in the Bible, and just the story of Abraham and how God called him and led him and, and got him to a point to where even Abraham had faith enough to believe that even if he killed his, the one and only son that God commanded him to do, that God could even raise him from the dead. It's truly a, a remarkable character out of the Bible. But, you know, everybody has different perceptions and different ideas about God because God is a personal God and we all experience him very differently. And uh, this is what some children wrote about God. They, they asked some kids ranging from the age of five and eight what they thought about God. And here, here's what some of these kids wrote. They said, Manny, age six, wrote, My mom talks to God when we need more money. It's pretty honest, right? Uh, this girl named Kayla age eight and a half, said, I wish God could make me famous soon, in big, bold letters. Uh, Ethan, age eight, says, God doesn't have a house. He doesn't need one except on Sundays, because that's the day he likes to rest. It's just what he thinks, right? Jackson, age seven, wrote this, I call God when I need help with things, but not my homework, because my mom says I have to do that by myself. You know, it's pretty good, right? It's a good rule to go by. Hey, man, every kid prays in school. Like, Lord, please give me that answer, right? Max, age eight, wrote this. He said, my father never believed in you, but my mom did. But when she got sick, now he prays, but my mom doesn't anymore. Isn't it amazing how we'll have so many different children and their experiences with God can be so very different. Matter of fact, if you look at America, and a very uh, awesome book was written a few years ago called, called The Four Gods of America. It's a very interesting read. But he uh, goes into detail about how most people perceive God in four very extreme ways. One is some people perceive God as, a, as an angry God or a punishing God. He's like the proverbial old guy on the porch with a shotgun loaded with lightning bolts, and he's just ready for you to mess up so he can punish you. And some people's perception of God is like that. He's just one angry God. He's very active in your life, but he's angry. And then some people have the perception of this benevolent God where he loves you so much, he doesn't even care if you sin or do anything wrong. He loves you and loves you and loves you. You can do whatever you want. He's going to love you because you're my child. And that's another extreme idea of God, that he just loves you so much, he doesn't even care if you do wrong. And that's another very active God in your life, and that's how some people view him. Then there are some people who look at God as a critical God. God is not active in your life. Matter of fact, he's just waiting for you to die so he can judge you. So your whole view of God is based on whether you do right or wrong. How much wrong have I done versus how much right have I done? Have I done enough right so I can make it and be judged accordingly? But here's the last type of, of people who have experienced or not experienced God. Some people view God as a distant God. That he's really not in my life and he really doesn't care about me. That basically that God came, he created everything, and he's like, all right, see y'all later. Y'all work it out amongst yourselves. Those are very four extreme views of God, but we see that throughout our country. Now listen, God is none of those extremes. You see, I, I've talked to people, and I, I, have you ever tried to witness to anybody? 
And you'll sit there, and I was talking to this one guy, his, his mother had just passed, and we were talking and discussing about the Lord because I saw just this opportunity to just talk about Jesus with him. And as I was talking with him, he's like, listen, pastor, I'm just going to stop you right there. I've been a trucker all my life. I've been to every state, and there's nothing in my life that has ever told me that God is a living God. So I, I just, you don't have to talk no more. I was like, listen, man, but I have experienced it, and he's a living God for me. And so you might not have faith, but I do. And I want to talk about them. Not everybody you encounter will have faith. But that's not the point. The point is, do you have faith? Do you believe in a living God? Do you love this God? And you believe in Him, and you will stake your whole life on it. Because I do. I believe in this God. And I believe that my God wants to get in your life. You know what? He will use anybody and everybody He can to get into your life. He's a personal, just, beautiful, graceful God who is abounding in steadfast love. But he's just. Amen? Some people have very strange views of God. And Abraham experienced God face to face in such a, a wonderful way. But I wanted to uh, just give you all some uh, pointers because some people say that God seems so wrathful in the Old Testament. I mean, a lot, there's a lot of people say, why is, why is he so wrathful? Why does he seem so mean and wrathful in the Old Testament? And you have to understand the scope of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. God is mapping out a plan for all of our salvation. It's a big, beautiful story from cover to cover. And you and I are in that story. Matter of fact, your life is a story unto God, a journey. God was preparing the way for his people to experience redemption. And so the three reasons why it seems God is so wrathful in the Old Testament is, number one, God is holy, and he, no darkness dwells in him. He's holy, and he is light, no darkness dwells there. And so he has said, I am holy, for I wish my people to be what? Holy. He wants his people to be just like him. And so that's why it seems like he's kind of wrathful, because he's holy God, he can't stand sin. Another reason that it seems like God is wrathful in the Old Testament, is that he is actively protecting and securing the Israelite nation. He starts with Abraham. He really even goes even back further. He starts with Noah. Because the world was so corrupt, he had to start over. And then he gave us this beautiful symbol in the sky. What's that called? A rainbow, right? In the Old Testament, it's called a bow. But have you ever thought about this? Have any of y'all ever shot a bow? Don't do it around people. Amen. It's very dangerous. But in, in a way, God hung his bow in the sky because he'd never shoot mankind in that way again. Isn't that interesting? God, every step of the way, is securing a path for eventually, at the perfect right time, he was going to send Jesus. And not just for the Israelites, but for all nations. So the first reason is he's holy. The second reason, he's actively securing a passage and a place for his people, that salvation will be for everybody. But the third reason, the most important reason is this. Sometimes God actively works in death in the Bible to stop a struggle or to stop an influence that could corrupt his people. And we see that throughout the Old Testament, that God actually will stop a nation or a group of people or even an individual you see, because death is nothing to God. God is eternal. Death has no sway over God. God gives life, and he takes it. Death is nothing to him. But for us, we got one shot, people. Amen? For us, we have one shot. And it's a gift from God. Every breath you're taking, every heartbeat, is from him. He's the God who gives you and supplies you everything that you have. And so, yes, it does seem like God can be very harsh in the Old Testament, but God is securing and actively making a way for his people. And so if there was a nation or a group or even an individual who could hinder God's plans for his people and corrupt them, God would deal with it in an efficient way that he would decide to do. Much like he does in this passage that we're going to look at of a place called Sodom and what? Gomorrah. See, most of us know about this story. We're going to look at it in detail this morning. But let's return back to the life of Abraham here. Let's look at uh, chapter 18. We see Abraham has a visit from three individuals as they're sitting in the hot heat. They, they just appear before him. And Abraham recognizes them as the presence of the Lord. 
And so you know what Abraham does? He ruins Sarah, Sarah's day. Have you men ever just like go in the house and just like, hey, we, need, we got people coming over, fix us something to eat. This is essentially what he did to Sarah. He just popped his head in the tent. He's like, hey, Sarah, make some biscuits, right? Here's a, a quick tip for you husbands. Come home and say, hey, honey, we're receiving a family of eight tonight. And see how she responds to it. If she's a good wife and she cooks you for eight, just eat like you're eight people. Amen? No, don't do that. That's wrong. Don't, don't fool around. You will get in so much trouble. But that's what Abraham did. He's like, hey, we, we have guests here. Let's fix them something to eat. Abraham recognized the presence of the Lord. He even wants to wash his feet. And in the process of Abraham honoring and, and giving devotion to God, you notice God appears in how many people? How many people here? Three. Very interesting. That's a very interesting number in the Bible, right? We have God the Father, God the, and God the who? Holy Spirit. So some commentators look at that as like, well, God was traveling with the angels he was sending. But here's a very interesting thing. If you look at this passage, they answered as one several times. Who can speak equally with God? Only God. So God revealed to Abraham all the way in Genesis his three persons. Isn't that amazing? That's awesome. And as he's talking to them, he reaffirms his promise that you will have a son from your own marriage with Sarah. And Sarah's in the tent just like any good wife. And what's she doing? Listening. <laughs> right? And then she hears the Lord say, you're going to have a child and it's going to be from Sarah. And she is tickled. She just starts laughing because that's impossible, right? It's just impossible for her age. It's impossible. And God says, why is Sarah laughing? Listen, Abraham doesn't even know Sarah's listening, right? They're just sitting there. And it's like, what? And Sarah's in the tent going, uh-oh. I didn't laugh. No, you did. God knows our hearts. He knows our intentions. But God says this. He said, what? Is, is there anything impossible for God? There's nothing. And so what is an interesting turn in this story, as God's leaving Abraham, he looks towards Sodom and is heading there, and then the Lord says, should I tell Abraham what I'm about to do over here? You know, because let me tell you, God will test your hearts at times. God will put situations in your life. He'll test you. See, Abraham had a nephew named Lot who was living in Sodom. And so God says, shall I tell him? And it's like, well, listen, uh, Abraham, Sodom, and Gomorrah, they've grown so greatly sinful that I'm going to destroy everybody. And then Abraham stands before the Lord. Almost, I almost would think in his way of going forward, he's like, Lord, please consider this. You're a just and right God. You, you can't. You can't kill an entire nation if there is 50 righteous people there. Would you do that? And then Abraham does this haggle game with God. He's like, would you do it for 45? Uh, 40? 30? 20? 10? And God says, no, I would not destroy it if 10 people were there. You know what's really sad we learned in this story? There wasn't even 10 people there. Because when God sends his angels, two of them, to Sodom, who do they come to right at the gate? They run right into Lot. And Lot says, hey, uh, how are you guys doing? Why don't you stay with me? And they say, no, we're going to sleep in the courtyard. And Lot says, no, that's not a good idea, guys. Why don't you all come in here and live with me? Or, or stay with me for tonight. But look at chapter 19. Look at this passage in verse 3. Chapter 19, verse 3. 19, verse 3. But he being Lot insisted strongly, so they turned into him and entered his house then he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Now before they laid down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter surrounded the house, and they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them to us that we may know them carnally. So Lot went out to them and through the doorway and shut the door behind him and said, Please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. See now, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please let me bring them to you and you can have them. But don't hurt these men who are under my care. And they said, stand back. And they said, the, this one man who came to stay here and he keeps acting as judge, now we will deal worse with you than with them. 
And they pressed hard against Lot and came near to break the door down. But the men reached their hands out and pulled Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck the men who were outside the door with blindness, both small and great, so that they became blind and weary of trying to find the door to get to them. That escalated quickly, didn't it? It's a rough section right there, isn't it? Sodom and Gomorrah, this passage of the Bible reveals how sinful and corrupt that world had become. It was so bad that two strangers who just happened in the city could have been badly hurt and killed right off the bat. That's how bad it was. And so this sets the level of why God would want to destroy this city in the first place. And, and it also tells us where Lot was at in his life. Lot, faced with these strangers protecting them, who was he willing to give over to this mob? His own daughters. How has Lot been living in this, this city corrupted him in any way? Christians, we have to be so careful who we put ourselves around. You have to be so very careful who you make friendships with. Listen, young people, listen. Choose your friends so wisely because they can corrupt you if you're not careful. Please be careful who you yoke yourselves with. Please be careful. All Lot did was begin to live outside the gates of Sodom. But the next time we see him, he's living in the city and he's becoming corrupted by it. You see, Jesus said that we are to live in the world but not be of what? Of the world. Guard your holiness. Because God is holy. Amen? So the angels then told Lot, gather whoever you love because we're going to destroy this place. You see what Lot does? He goes and he tells his sons-in-laws, and they just thought he was joking. He's like, listen, God's going to destroy this place. And they're like, oh, that, that's a joke, right? And then Lot lingered. He didn't do anything. The angels had to take Lot, his wife, and his two daughters who were not married, and they fleed the city. And they said, Lot, don't look back and keep on going to the mountains. And Lot said, oh, I can't run that far. I'm scared. Let me go to this little town called Zor. And I'll stay there. And the angels probably rolled their eyes. It's like, all right, Lot, yeah, you can go to that town. We'll spare that town. But don't look back. We all know this story, right? That morning when they hit that town of Zor, God lit the sky up and fire and ash fell from heaven and destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and all those cities around it. And as they ran from the destruction Lot's wife, what did she do? She looked back. And she became a pillar of what? Salt. Christians, Jesus wants you going forward. He wants you going forward. There's things in your life, in your past, they don't need to be there anymore. There's people who have been in your life and they've dragged you down and they've tried to create corruption in your life. You don't need to look back anymore. God has called you to be a new creation in Him. Behold, all things are new. Go forward, go forward, go forward. And then Abraham from a distance where he had just talked to God saw the fires fall from heaven. What a uh, probably a horrible and devastating thing to see. But what can we learn through this entire story here? I want to give you uh, ten things. For those of you who like to take notes, i got ten points on why this story is valid today for a Christian. This is very important. Are you all ready? Say, I'm ready. And then we're going to eat chicken. Amen? You all ready? He's like, no, brother, I like ham, right? Amen? Here we go. Uh, point number one, God keeps his promises. He told Abraham, you would have a son from your wife Sarah. And God fulfilled that promise. He fulfilled His promise when He said, Abraham, your descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky, the sand of the beach. And He fulfilled that promise. Now, God has given us a new promise. That whosoever would call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Saved. God keeps His promises. Number two, God gives special knowledge to His believers do you know that? God told Abraham what he was going to do. God sent angels to tell a lot what was going to happen. 
And listen, God sent His Son to the earth to tell us of God's grace and salvation. He's given us special knowledge that if we have faith and believe in Jesus, then you shall not perish, but you will have what? Everlasting life. Who thinks that's a really good thing? Amen? He's given us this special knowledge, but point three is this. This knowledge places responsibility on who? Us believers. You have this knowledge. What are you doing with this knowledge? Because listen, just like in the days of Lot, people were just buying and selling, doing whatever they thought was good and nice, and they had no idea that destruction was right there. And listen, today, Jesus gives us a promise. He said, I will return. What are we doing with that information? Jesus wants us prepared. But there are two types of Christians. There are some Christians who say, come Lord Jesus, come quickly. And then the other type of Christians like, can you wait a little longer? Because some of us, we think we got things to do, amen? But listen, when Jesus comes back, you're not going to care about those things. You're not. Num number four, God invests, or excuse me, God investigates the acts of evil people. It says in the book of Psalms, God sees the nations. It says in scriptures that Jesus knew the intent of the heart of a person before they even spoke. God knows what's dealing and going on in the hearts of mankind. And listen, He will deal with evil. Do you know what our part is? Pray. You know what our part is? Be a light. You know what our part is? Share Jesus. He'll take care of that evil. Number five, God wants us to intercede for somebody. Abraham interceded for Lot and the people of Sodom. Lot tried to intercede for his family, but some of them wouldn't even listen. And, and our job is to try to intercede for those around us and love them and tell them of Jesus. Uh, number six, he holds judgment of the wicked because of righteousness. He, he withholds judgment from the wicked because of the righteous. How do we know this? Because when Lot said, I'm too tired, I can't run to the mountains, I'm scared, let me go to Zor. Well, Zor was one of the places God was going to destroy too. But because of Lot going to Zor, God spared it. I often wonder how many times that we have been spared because of the account of a righteous person. Amen. Number seven, he is always merciful and just. His ways are, are higher than ours. His thoughts are not like ours. But Lot was living in a place that had corrupted his relationship to God. Lot, in all honesty, could have been destroyed right along with all those other people. Guess what? It says that our righteousness is like filthy rags to him. You see, it's nothing because of his mercy that we don't experience God's justice. And his grace. Number eight, it says this He delivers the righteous out of wrath. Every one of us, we have been delivered from the wrath of God because of Jesus. You say, Well, Pastor, I've never done anything really bad. You know, it says in Scripture that the wages of sin is what? Death. And every one of us. You know, probably one of the best testimonies I hear is people come into Christ and they're really good people. They're just really great people. They're just wonderful people, but they came to Jesus. Why? Because they understand that, that no matter how good you are uh, innately, we, we sin. We're sinful people. And we need Christ's grace to cover us. The cross provides the bridge to God that we need. Number nine, that God does pour out His wrath and judgment on evil. And if you read your Bible, he is going to do that one day. He is going to do that one day. But here is the very important thing. If you have Jesus, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, and you will not experience any bad thing. No punishment. It says in Romans 8, chapter, uh, chapter 8, verse 1, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. You don't have to worry about that. And number 10, our last point here, God gives second chances. Aren't you glad about that? He gives second chances. 
heard a testimony of a man. He was bad. He said his best friend was alcohol. No other friend could meet his needs than alcohol. And his mama was uh, just a devout woman. She loved Jesus. And she prayed for her son all the time. He'd get sick of it sometimes. They'd be at the table, and she was like, let's bless the food. And, it, and she said she would just start preaching while she's praying and talking about me. And she's just sitting there and like, Lord, save my son, my wayward son from alcohol. And it would really burn him up sometimes. But he knew his mama loved him. He knew that. But she'd pray for him all the time that he would let that go. But that was just a part of his life. When he was much older in life, his mother got older, she passed away. And he remembered uh, him and his sisters going through his mama's things. And she found, they found her prayer journal. I don't know how many of y'all keep a prayer journal, but this woman just took, or excuse, her son took the prayer journal and looked at it and was flipping through the pages. You see, uh, many years ago, when he was in his 20s, he was in a bad car accident. And do you know why? Because of alcohol. And he remembers the first thing he remembers waking up after a week in a hospital bed was hearing his mama's voice praying over him. See, she was right at that bed with her hands and head down praying for her son. And that's the first distinct memory when he woke up, got consciousness, he heard his mom praying. And he opened that journal and he went to that week that he was in the car accident. And, and she wrote this at the bottom of her journal. And then he found it on many other pages. It said this, Son, I hope you're reading this because it means I'm with Jesus. And I prayed for you, for God to spare you until you would call out to him. And it rent his heart. It broke his heart. He went to bed immediately and just tossed and turned all night saying, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But he said, when I got out of that bed the next morning, I was a new creation. And he says, not a day goes by, I wish my mama had seen me live as a Christian. But now today, I will see her again. See, God gives second chances. And I'm so thankful that sometimes he gives us third, fourth, and fifth chances. Amen. But he's just that good. Would you please stand as we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, Although I am not sure how everyone perceives you, whether they think you're an angry God or a benevolent God, a critical God, or maybe even a distant God, Father, my prayer is that your Spirit would make your presence so real in their life that they would surrender and embrace that second chance that you give every person on this earth. And Lord, we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus, our soon coming King. Amen.